Good morning and welcome. It's good to see you all this morning. Uh, I have just a couple of announcements before we begin our time of worship. So if you have your bulletin with you, that will help. Um, I want to begin by just highlighting something that happened at the CBA auction. Every Thursday, we have a group of ladies who faithfully come to work on different quilts. One of the quilts they worked on made its way into the CBA or the Corn Bible Academy auction, and it was purchased for $5,000. Uh, so what, what a blessing. What a blessing. Um, also, just wanted to update you on our t-shirt design contest. Uh, we're inviting you now to put a little tally mark. So the t-shirt designs are out on a whiteboard kind of in front of Amanda's office. If you will just take the marker that's provided, there we go, and put a tally mark on two of your favorites, right? So you don't even have to choose your very, very favorite. You can choose two of them, just a tally mark, and we will use that to kind of guide which ones we print first, all right? And we'll announce that at our um, April 25th members meeting, which is also a potluck Sunday. Um, it's at this members meeting that we will seek to approve the minutes from the annual business meeting and hear from the kitchen remodel committee about some of the plans that they've been working on. At this time, I'd invite Cindy and Kyle to come forward. I'm just going to draw your attention to uh, in the bulletin. The event uh, talking about Global Disciples, that will be um, Saturday, April 27th. That will be in here. Um, it's going to be a very um, informal time where Tim Sprunger and Jerry Meadows will be sharing some stories that uh, they've experienced or seen or heard um, of people who have worked with the Global Disciples around the world. But then also, how do we take that and how do those of us who are around non-believers on a daily basis, how do we take those same principles that they use and apply it to our lives? So I think it'll be a really encouraging um, and interesting time. So I invite you to come, invite somebody who might be interested, 9 to 9.30, we'll have donuts and coffee, and then we'll get started about 9.30. Um, and then the night before that, Friday evening, we'll be having an event at um, the Thomas Stafford Air and Space Museum. It'll be a meal, they'll be doing a presentation. It's focused a lot for kind of getting some awareness of Global, but it will be a fundraiser also. If you would like to attend that, if you could please contact me. Um, so we're trying to do table hosts and get people at the right spot. So um, if you can contact me and let me know if you're interested in coming so I can get you down. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, just catch me. Good morning. Um, I am going to teach a Bible class for grades first grade through eighth grade. It's a big range, but um, on Wednesdays in May and June, so we don't ever have summer stuff for this age, but um, I just, just, God led me to do that. So it's um, from the curriculum of Answers in Genesis, and it's based on the book, The Answers, The Answers Book for Kids, 22 Questions for them. Four kids on God and the Bible. So um, bring your kids 6.30 to 7.30 on Wednesday starting in May. And we'll meet in the commons room and make sure they bring their Bible. And we will answer questions about God and the Bible. Well, it's appropriate to do a new thing, right? That's what God's doing in us. So thank you, Cindy. Are there any other announcements? Okay, well, I have uh, two young people who have been filling out clipboards or the pages on the clipboards. So, would Emery come forward and Ben? And after worship, Faith will have a treat with, for you. So, if you will meet her out where that kind of treasure box is out in the foyer. So, Ben, hand, other hand. <laughs> we'll practice this for a hopeful graduation someday. Okay, you take that. Thank you. And Emery. Good job. <laughs> Michael, will you call us to worship?
Good morning, church. Thank you. The church talks back to me, interacts with me. I appreciate that. I would invite you to uh, turn your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be reading from that in just a few minutes. How many of you remember this from last Sunday? Jeff, it it was towards the end of his sermon, and uh, he caught my attention. Well, he had my attention most of the time anyway, but he caught my attention here. Church is not a what? It's not a place. It's a people. That's right. It's not an organization. It is a or an organism. And of course, my mind immediately goes back to sixth grade. And I'm not sure what uh, teaching science, and I'm not sure what Jeff has in mind when he says church is an organism, but I even have notes in my Bible that I'd made many years ago, and I start thinking about the characteristics of living or once living organisms, and we all have them, excuse me, if we're a living organism, from the simplest of cells to fungi to plants to to animals, which are generally the more complex uh, species even to the most complex organism that God created, so complex that he created them to have a relationship with him. And that would be mankind. The only organism that he created that would have a soul, that he had created in his image, and that he could have a relationship with God. And so what are some of these characteristics? All living organisms or once living organisms, they, did re- they do respiration. They breathe in and out. They move. They respond to stimuli. Uh, they reprodu- reproduce and they grow. And they are dependent upon their environment. And so if we're talking about the church, a group of Christians, what does this mean? I mean, okay, our church, we want to reproduce and grow, right? We are breathing in the breath of life and, and out, and we move, and we um, are dependent upon our environment, which would obviously be centered around Jesus Christ. That's right. And we respond to our stimulus, or our, and our, who stimulates us? Jesus Christ, once again. That's right. And so we have that. And I was thinking about the early churches in Acts. You know, what were the characteristics of the early church? And they were teaching. They were praying together. They were fellowshipping together, eating together. Uh, They were making sure that each other's needs were being met physically and spiritually. And then finally, they praise God together. So if you would want to, I would invite you to, let's read from 1 Corinthians about this church. Starting with verse 12, the body is a unit. And remember, the body, we're talking about Christ's church. The body is a unit. It is made up of many parts and Though all its parts are many, they form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, the church. Whether Jews, Greeks, Thomas, Weatherford, Hydro, whomever, slave or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, and it would not, uh, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. And if the eye should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, 
and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special care. And the parts that are unrepresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body, um, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, and that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And Paul goes on to say in verse 27, you are part of the body of Christ. Yes, he was talking to the church in Corinth. He's talking to those here at Pleasant View this morning. You are the body of Christ, and each one of you ha is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles, those having gifts of healing, and those uh, who are able to help others, and those with the gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do, not, do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? He says, do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. So in conclusion, I feel like our goal should be that we don't want to be stagnant. We want to be active. We want to be responsive, listening for God. What does he want for us? We want to be praising God. Uh, we want to continue in our fellowship. We want to make sure that each other's needs are met whomever it may be, and most importantly, we want to seek his will for us as a body um, of believers and what he's calling us to do. Let us pray, please. Let's bow our heads. God, we are gathered here in this place today, not as individuals alone, but as a group of individuals gathered together your church to worship and praise you. We want to thank you for calling us to be your body of Christ here on this earth. Lord, help us to not just want to sit idly on our hands, but we want to listen to what you are calling to us to do as one body. We want to be ready to respond to your stimulus and be active in what you would want us to do. Help each of us individuals to realize what our role is and be ready to perform it. Help us to listen to your words as they are spoken today, to grow individually and as a body. And we just pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we continue to worship this morning, I invite you to stand as we sing, I know that my Redeemer liveth. <clears throat>
Morning. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you for another beautiful day that you've given to us, that we are able to stand up and come over here to your word, Lord, and be ready and be safe out here. Lord, I come today and I say thank you for all the people on the back of the prayer request list, Lord. It looks like a lot of people are recovering, Lord, from surgeries and that it all went good, and I ask that you will be with them in the recovery process, Lord, and that there will there be healing, Lord, and just be with the people around the world, Lord, that's willing to give their time and life to go out there and make disciples of you. Lord, I ask that you will be with us today and that we will uh, take the Sabbath, Lord, and just rest out and enjoy the day that you've given for us for resting. Thank you for the seasons that's changing, Lord, and the wonderful weather that's coming in, green grass that's coming in, Lord. Lord, I ask that in this great season with the challenges in Oklahoma and the wild weather that you will protect us through this season too, Lord. But thank you that we could see your almightiness in this weather and the wind, Lord. Lord, I ask that you will be with us and keep us safe and that you will open our ears and our hearts to hear what you want to say through Jeff this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time I invite the children to come forward to put money in the offering bank. Jesus loves me, this I know.
This morning's scripture is from Acts 2, 1 through 11. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributed and resting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and wondered, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. heads in prayer. God, we are here to at this point in time of our service. God, I just ask that uh, you would help us to put away the distractions of life and to concentrate on what you would be speaking through our brother Jeff to today. Give him the words to speak. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week, we started a new series that I'm kind of calling Rediscover the Church. We want to continue in that. We're going to push through till the end of April. Um, I think this topic is really important. Uh, when we have a wrong or incomplete or partial understanding of something, our very best response then will be wrong, incomplete, and partial. Uh, do you remember the old game uh, that we used to play when, we were, I, when I was a kid, all right? Uh, it's not been that long ago, but when I was a kid, uh, we would play telephone. Does anyone remember this game? Show of hands. Familiar with it? So for those of you who don't know or didn't get a chance to play it, uh, the way it's worked out, you get a group of people, we would sit in a circle, and someone would get to start the message, all right? So you make the call, if you will. And so they would come up with some sort of a short sentence or phrase, and then they would turn to their neighbor and they would whisper it in their ear. The neighbor then would turn and whisper it to the person sitting beside them. And it would continue until it made it all the way around the circle and would come back to the person sitting right beside you, if you were the person who started. And this person would announce to the whole group, they'd kind of stand up, and it was a big deal, this is what the message was. And as you can imagine, for those of you who have played, the message would get twisted, right? Right? Um, someone wouldn't hear right. Um, sometimes people intentionally left stuff out or added stuff in. Um, but it was the job then of the person speaking and then the person who started it, did you get it right? right? And what made it fun was oftentimes we didn't get it right. Um, but that's only a game, right? Uh, when, when lives are at stake, we want to get it right. It, it's not so funny anymore, right? Well, the message of the good news was intended and is intended to be safeguarded and spoken through believers. Of course, the easiest way for Satan to disrupt this process is to cause people to question the messenger, right? That's what we do. We question the messenger, thus robbing the message of its power. Now, this has happened in our society. Uh, believers and churches... Um, have been relegated to labels like quaint or even more caustic, irrelevant. Okay? People see the church today as really just not that important. It doesn't affect our lives. It doesn't affect the lives of our nation or the future of our nation. Um, in fact, the Barna Research Group did some uh, work, and they found that 77% of Americans view themselves as being spiritual. That means they believe in some sort of a God, lower G, or some higher power, okay? But those same 77 people, only a third of them will ever show up to gather with anyone of a like faith. So while we may say that we're really spiritual, somewhere there's a disconnect between what we're saying and what we're doing. A little bit like that telephone game, right? There's, there's a disconnect. We're, somewhere we've, we've got the idea that church is for them and not for us, not for me. Well, these are pretty significant challenges that we need to overcome. Uh, last week, we began to do that a little bit, and I asked the question, so what is church? Now, 
there's a number of different ways to answer this, but the essential pieces of the definition, whatever you're using, needs to include believers and group, okay? Or group and believers. Somehow those two need to be paired together. Um, we've got believers, and you could use the term followers of Jesus, um, disciples of Christ, uh, any number of ways to describe this. But it's more than one person, and they have to believe in Jesus. At Pleasant View, this is the first line of our purpose statement in our Constitution that we adopted last summer. PVMC is a community, that's the group piece, of disciples of Jesus, okay? It lets everyone know really what we're all about. Now, the good news in this statement is that everyone, and I mean anyone, who professes Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior can be a part of the community, okay? They can, they can be a part of this church. But our purpose statement doesn't stop there. The next sentence starts to answer the next logical question someone has after you've identified, so what is the church? Well, what does it do, right? What's the function of the church? And to answer this question today, we're going to go back about 2,000 years and identify where we get some good information about what are we supposed to be about, right? So, if you will, I invite you to turn in your Bibles. We're going to actually start in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I want to remind you of something we talked a little bit about last week. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples right before he ascends. And we, it could be beyond his disciples. Remember, there could be a lot of other people in the room that are unnamed at this point. But he tells everybody who's gathered there that day, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and this is what will happen, right? You will be my witnesses. And then he identifies Jerusalem, Judea, which Jerusalem's in Judea, Samaria, which would be just north of Judea and Jerusalem, and then to the ends of the earth. And we can imagine all the way, everywhere, right? Even to the far reaches of the Roman Empire. In Acts chapter 2, we see not just the disciples being Jesus' witnesses, but now that group has grown. So where there was 11, and then they replaced um, Judas Iscariot with Matthias, now we have a group of 120 that are getting together. And so we're going to go and look at a little bit more of what was read for us by the Stigmans in chapter 2 of Acts. Now, in the opening line of chapter 2, we get an understanding or a sense of the time frame that we're talking about relative to Jesus' death and resurrection, right? The very first line, probably in your Bible, says something like this. When the day of Pentecost came. Everybody have that? Now, Pentecost isn't one of those terms that we often throw around, so we want to explore it just a little bit so we get into the context of this passage because there's some pretty powerful things happening here. So I'm in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start here in verse 1 and kind of work through it. But we're looking at this idea of Pentecost. Now, for all the Jews that had gathered that day, they probably didn't call it Pentecost, right? They probably called it the Festival of the Weeks, all right? Now, um, when we take apart Pentecost, uh, for those of you who are um, savvy in Greek, you'll see penta and you'll think, oh, well, that means five, right? And so well, really what we're describing here is five tens, 50 days after Sabbath. Um, the Jews would call it the festival of the weeks because there were seven weeks, and then the next day was this festival, right? Fifty days. Um, the thing that's important here is this is the second of the pilgrimage feasts that God gives the Israelites. The first one was the Passover, and now 50 days later, we have the second one, this festival of the weeks. And this is where we, we learn a little bit about what God wants from the people and how they should respond to him. And for this, we go back into the, the, what we call the law, the first five books of your Bible, and we're going to go back into Leviticus chapter 23. Okay, so God is laying out all these ways for the children of Israel to remember that he is God and he is the one who has redeemed them from slavery and bondage in Egypt. And God tells them from the day after the Sabbath, and now he's speaking Passover language here, if you See this whole passage in its context. The day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, 
count off a full seven weeks, right? The seven weeks, seven times seven, 49 plus one. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present as an offering of the new grain to the Lord, the festival of the weeks. Now, today the Israel, or Jews continue to celebrate this. Uh, they call it Shavuot, um, which is really more commemorating not new grain, but they are commemorating when God gave the law to the Israelites. So God brings them out of Egypt, and then God is interacting with them in ways that they've never had a God interact with them. Right? He's speaking, and, and powerful things are happening around him. He's speaking through Moses, but he's also speaking directly to the people. And so they commemorate this day, Shavuot, right? Um, and that's the festival of the weeks. That's what everybody is doing in Jerusalem at the time of this passage. Everybody is getting ready to celebrate this. Now, the significance then of the timing um, is that, remember, Jesus was celebrating Passover with his disciples right before his crucifixion and then resurrection three days later. The significance is this. Jesus was the lamb sacrificed so the death angel would pass over us, right? Uh, we can start to imagine Jesus taking the place of this lamb that they used during Passover. Jesus is our lamb, right, today. So we don't have to die for our sins, but Jesus has already done that for us, right? He's made us right before God. We communicate this often by saying not so much that Jesus is the lamb slain for us or the Passover lamb, just saying that Jesus died for our sins, now, Jesus' resurrection then three days later speaks to his ability to reconcile us fully to God, to make us new, literally new creations, right? So when we're baptized, that's the imagery used. You were old, your old self is getting wet and washed away, and your new self emerges. You go from this position, which would be death, to this position, which is standing upright, which is resurrection, with this as the backdrop, then 50 days later, we have Jesus speaking to the people for 40 days after his resurrection. Then he ascends into heaven, and he tells his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they receive power from the Holy Spirit. So their wait is about 10 days long. Right? So 40 minus 50, or 50 minus 40 is 10. So it's, it's a fairly short wait. The rest of the sentence of Acts tells us how they waited. So this very first sentence in chapter 1, or in chapter 2 of Acts, says, and it completes then, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, right? Um, now, this really shouldn't surprise us. When Jesus was calling disciples, did he plant them right where they were? No. They had to follow him. They had to be where Jesus was, which literally meant they had to drop what they were doing, and sometimes that's exactly the case. They dropped their nets. The first disciples dropped their nets when they saw Jesus and he was calling to them, and they follow him. So it shouldn't surprise us that they were together because when you're following Jesus, you have to leave what you once were to be who Jesus has called you to be. However, there was a bit of a challenge if you remember the story leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. On the night he was arrested, what did the disciples do? They scattered, right? They all kind of abandoned Jesus. Um, in fact, they wouldn't even fully return until after Jesus has appeared to a number of them a number of times. And it's only after Jesus has been appearing to them that they regain this practice of coming together or gathering together. Now, a specific point is made here by Luke, and the message is simple. It's one that we need to take to heart. The church gathers together. It doesn't declare in what form or how, but if you are a believer and you follow Jesus, it will draw you to other believers, and you will gather with them for strength and encouragement. Right? We were, when I hear people talk about the state of the world today, I say, praise the Lord, right? It's getting dark. Well, that should make the light all that more obvious, right? But we need to gather together to encourage each other because quite honestly, when you're fighting against something all the time, you can wear down, you get tired, we fatigue. And so we need that encouragement, that sharing together, 
to get us riled up again as we go out and share the good news. Now, as you think about this idea of church, the church gathers together, remember, I need you to think on two different levels. The first level being the church universal. This is every Christian around the world, every believer around the world, all 2.2 billion plus, right, around the world we're going to include in this group. Somewhere they're gathering, right? That specific somewhere is the second part of church, which is a local manifestation of the church universal. That's you today, okay? You are the, local, you are the universal manifestation of the local church. And you need to be. We need it, right? We need tangible people to rub shoulders with to encourage us so we can go back out into the mission field. Now, gathering together has not always been easy. Persecution has threatened gatherings. Certainly, the Anabaptist heritage for which has been passed down to us, they were often persecuted. Uh, leaders were killed. And so gathering together was challenging at times. Uh, we still see that today in places where governments seek to limit how many people can get together. I'm thinking specifically of China. Um, but the church is finding ways to replicate itself even in the midst of that. They understand how important it is to get together. Not only have we faced persecution from the outside, but we also experience strife from the inside. We start to get into debates about what does this mean, and if you think that way and I think this way, can we actually be one? Can we be unified? Um, I would say yes, and we'll go a little bit more in this, as long as Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Um, this gathering in the midst of all this stuff, all this trouble, is the very first thing that the church does. So we have what the church is. It's a community of disciples of Jesus. What does it do? Well, it gathers. Right? We're going to keep it simple. It gathers. It overcomes whatever obstacle it might see in its gathering to be a witness to the Jesus who enables us to overcome. Now, shying away from gatherings isn't a new thing. Um, I go back to that Barna research where people talked about being really spiritual, but they never get together with anybody who thinks the same way that they do. This isn't a new thing. Even before the Bible was canonized, even before it was compiled as we have it today, people were giving into the temptation of not gathering together for a host of reasons. To these people, the author of Hebrews says, let us not give up meeting together, right? He's recognizing the importance of it. And then he'll identify some people are doing this, but let's not be like them. Instead, let's get together, and he identifies really kind of what we can be doing when we get together. Let's encourage one another. And as we see, even all the more as we see the day coming, and that day is the return of Jesus. All right, so we, we want to stir each other up. We want to encourage each other. We want to gather together as the church. Believers then, and I hope to an extent us today, are beginning to rediscover this very important component. In the book that's offered out on the, the table in the foyer, the author will say it a different way, right? Instead of saying, gather together, they simply say, a Christian without a church is a Christian in trouble, right? So if you want to isolate yourself, you're in trouble. Believers gather together, right? It's a hallmark of what Jesus was doing. He was trying to unify people under himself. Well, Let's uh, return to Acts chapter 2 and kind of rediscover the second thing that the church does. And the piece here is from, I'll keep reading from uh, verse 2 on. So you can imagine uh, they're all together in this house and there is this horrific noise. Um, I won't try to simulate it. I don't want to hurt anyone's ears here, but you can, you can imagine it, right? This, this sound, this wind, and we have been blessed to live in Oklahoma. We understand what that kind of a sound is, this howling, this freight train type of noise that kind of uh, even makes, even as I think about it, kind of makes my hair stand on end. That kind of noise comes. And the whole house where they're at is filled with this noise. So you can imagine what's drawing people to this commotion from the outside. There's this big boom, there's this big noise, and everybody starts to gather to it. Here's what's happening inside the house. 
the people there, the 120, saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Luke then says in chapter, in verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. They had all come for the festival of the weeks. And here's where they came from, right? When they heard this sound, they came together bewildered because each one of, of them, each one of them, sorry, because each one heard them, there we go, speaking in his own language. Um, and they're just utterly amazed. And they begin asking, are not these men who are speaking Galileans? They're from a specific region. They shouldn't know the way I speak. They shouldn't know my native tongue. How is it that each of us hears them in their own native language? And then we get this host of people where they're coming from. And they're coming from all over, right? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, uh, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. All of these people from all over, right? We understand because they're speaking our language specifically. In this brief couple verses, we find a group of 120 people, which we'll call a church, being led by the Holy Spirit. Something that is outside of their experience, something that is not man-contrived, but something that is God-given, and it's going to purpose them, right? So the church is led by the Holy Spirit, and it is purpose-driven. Remember, Jesus is the head of the church, so it would be logical that God's eternal spirit would empower the church's witness, right? That's what all these guys were told that they would need to be, witnesses of Jesus. Now, what's significant about this is that it's still God directing us, right? It's still God leading us. The second line of our purpose statement at Pleasant View, then, is PVMC is empowered by the Holy Spirit and focused on advancing God's kingdom. That's our purpose. That's why we exist, if you will. It means we listen to the Spirit and we seek to be responsive to it versus being led by a personality or a person. Okay? A church should not be pastor-focused. It's people-focused. The church is not a business organization. I'm going to kind of pick up a little bit of the theme that uh, Michael was talking about during his call to worship. We are not led by a CEO. We are not an entity um, that can come and go. Within this model of a kind of a CEO, the pastor of a church should not wield authority any greater than conferred upon them by God and through God's people. Right? I don't get to declare myself a God. I don't get to dictate and be a tyrant unto the church. That's not what the church is about. This, is, this kind of concept is very different than businesses where the CEO will dictate direction or the founder will dictate direction. They'll assemble a board to further the cause of the business. But recognize the business is temporal. And it's not the cause of Christ, because the cause of Christ is eternal. Right? So we're about the eternal business. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit empowers everyone with a common purpose, and it's still true today. It enables everyone in the house that day to declare the wonders of God. Everyone. Luke makes a special point of using the word all multiple times during this kind of opening chapters of Acts. He wants to make sure that everyone knows that everyone is included. It's just a matter of hearing and receiving. And then you're in. It doesn't matter where you're from, which we learned from this laundry list of people who had come this pilgrimage to Jerusalem. All that matters is that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Well, the group that's all together that is led by the Spirit is now filled by the Spirit. 
And just as then, believers each are gifted differently. The, the language Luke uses as each is enabled, or the Spirit enabled each as it was given. Um, and the same is true for us. So as you look around, there's lots of different gifts out here. But hear me clearly, the point of your gift is not to raise up yourself. The point of our giftings are the same. They are to share the wonders of God. Right? They are to share the wonders of God. This is the phrase that is being repeated here, that all these people, how, how can we hear the wonders of God in our native tongue? Well, what are the wonders of God? Here I'm going to go a little bit further. I'm going to push uh, into Acts uh, chapter 2, and, and really beginning in verse 14, Peter will step to the forefront, and Peter's always the initiator, right? He's always, he's always quick, um, and he will begin to interpret, this is what's happening. That noise you heard, what you are seeing and hearing from us, this is God doing something in us, right? This is God doing something through us, and Peter will begin to share the gospel. He tells them that Jesus is the Messiah, and he explains a little bit how they have interacted with him. Jesus is the one who saves us. He's the one whose example we seek to follow because Jesus is our Savior and Lord. And then he concludes this kind of uh, powerful uh, message with a call. And this is Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 38. And he tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The very thing that we are uh, manifesting right now can be yours. And the promise is for you and your children. And then he goes on a little bit further, and again he uses the word all, and for all who are far off. This would be not just Jews that don't know about Jesus being the Messiah. We're talking about Jews and other people outside of Judaism, Gentiles us. This is where we join the story, right? To us, those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now, the Holy Spirit's movement at Pentecost has some ramifications beyond just that day. Pentecost is God's great reversal of the Tower of Babel story. So if you go back to the beginning of your Bible in Genesis, um, after the creation stories in chapters 1 and 2, you're going to get into four stories about sin. Okay, We hear about the sin of Adam and Eve. We have the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, we have sin spreading to where it contaminates everything, so God's going to cleanse everything with a, a flood, except for Noah and his family. That's the third story, the Noah story. And then there's this fourth story. As everything's kind of being put back together, we still see that people don't get it. They don't understand God's purpose. In this last sin story, the people get together and they say, we're going to make a name for ourselves. And we're going to build this big tower. Okay? We're still doing that today. right? It's a big deal. Who has the tallest building on the planet? And so it's, it's common to us. All right? What's uncommon is that day, God looks down and he goes, oh, they're going to complete it. And so he confuses their speech he changes their language, and they lack the ability from that point forward to communicate in meaningful ways that allows them to finish this tower. And so they spread out, they divide, because that's what we do when we can't talk to someone. We, we kind of cluster with people we can, right? And so they spread out. This particular Pentecost, the one immediately following Jesus' ascension, marks the beginning of God doing something new. It is in this moment that God is unifying creation under the singular purpose of making the gospel known. Okay? That's what you and I get to be a part of. Everyone that heard the gospel in their native language that day is a part of that vision. The, the purposes of God, the salvation found in Jesus is for everyone. It doesn't matter what language they speak. This purpose of sharing the gospel to everyone continues today. In the announcement that Kyle made about global disciples, if you'll look on their emblem, they changed it. So if you knew global disciples 10 years ago, 
and you look again today, they have just the top third of a circle, right? The third of the circle represents those who have not yet heard the gospel in their own language, right? And their tagline is, until the whole world knows. That's our purpose, okay? That's our purpose, till the whole world knows. Well, as the story of Pentecost wraps up, it offers us one last point about the church. God calls others through the church into the church. Okay, let me say it again. God calls others through the church, through each of you, through the manifestation of whatever gift the Holy Spirit has given you as a believer of Jesus, into a church. Again, it's universal everywhere, but specifically somewhere, right? Now, there might be someone out there who would say, well, hang on, Jeff. Uh, God has come near people without someone telling them about it. That's true, right? Um, we have stories of Moses, of Abraham. There's a few outliers where God reveals himself in a pretty powerful way just to that person, and we don't know if they had any prior knowledge. However, that is not the typical way. God typically uses people who know him to call others to him. That's the whole point of calling 12 disciples to follow him in the first place, right? Now, I want you to imagine yourself kind of as the example here, all right? So a little participation as we get ready to kind of close out our service. It will involve raising your hand. You don't have to raise it real high, just, you know, kind of about here. Um, who told you about Jesus? Right? Who told you about Jesus? Did God reveal himself to you specifically without any other knowledge of him? Is there anyone in here that that's true of? And it might be. I don't want to negate. God can do whatever he wants. Okay, I don't see anyone. Who here heard about Jesus? Who here heard the good news through a parent through a Sunday school teacher, through a camp counselor, through a friend, through someone they met at church? What are, what are the other ways that you've heard that I've not mentioned? Right? We've heard it through someone else. All right? Now, the question that I want you to ponder on today is who is God calling through you to join the church? Remember that telephone game that we started out with? I used that as an illustration. We are somewhere in that circle. For generations, the message has been passed down, and sometimes the message isn't right, and there's a little correction that God does with the message. But the message has come to you and I that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, or wants to be. That he has reconciled us to God, that you can be right before God, that you don't have to have fear, shame, and guilt anymore. God's answered that question. So imagine yourself in that circle, okay? And it's your turn to turn to the person next to you and whisper the good news. All I'm asking is, who is that person? Who is that person? Well, last week I introduced some words to help begin reshaping our understanding of church and, and hopefully communicate a better understanding to those around us or those outside the church specifically. And I invite you to join me in repeating these words again. This is something that Michael showed at the beginning of the service. So we will uh, speak these words together. Um, and again, I'll let you continue to ponder on what this means. If it's not this and it's this, what does that mean for us here? And we'll continue to answer those questions over the next two weeks. So together, church, speak with me. Church isn't a place, it's a people. It's not an organization. It's an organism. It's not an establishment. It's a movement. Church isn't an institution. It's a Jesus revolution, and he's calling everyone to join. Amen. Amen. Kyle, will you come and lead us in our closing song?